My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCann.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey Can, your host today, and I'm joined by Chris Earle, who is with a Gyro Data or Gyro Data. If you, <laughs> it depends on how you pronounce Data, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, Chris, we are based where? Uh, I'm based out of the Houston, Texas office down in the U.S. Fantastic. What is the uh, so? Tell me about a little bit about the origins of your company and what um, you know. Where, where where did you get started? Okay, interesting. Pretty interesting story. I don't know how much time you have. Uh, <laughs> Job data first started uh, as a means to solve a problem that they had in the North Sea back in the days of hitting live wells. So um, as you as you are aware, hmm. uh, the main um, use for guiding well bores uh, in the drilling phase is magnetics. So in the North Sea back in the 70s, uh, they kept hitting wells because they had poor magnetic quality sensors downhole. Uh, and they had so many wells around that there was a lot of magnetic interference from the other casing strings, also from the drill ships and offshore platforms. Of course, yeah. And so you're, you'll be drilling away and suddenly encounter an existing, pre-existing facility that you didn't know was there or was uh, un, uh, otherwise uh, invisible to you at the surface. Right. Yeah. So um, they, the, guy, the guys that uh, started Gyro Data came up with a novel concept to use a gyroscope that was used for sea navigation that doesn't have any type of um, magnetic interference and uh, put in a sensor into a probe that would go down hole and uh, then give a better placement of the wellbore subsurface. Mm. And what did that benefit? And what was the, the outcome of that, uh, that work? I, I, I presume it uh, improved and, and eliminated the, this uh, problem of, of hitting uh, other infrastructure. Well, it hasn't eliminated it. <laughs> they still hit uh, other wells today. Um, but what it has done is it's drastically reduced the ellipse of uncertainty downhole on all different um, measurement devices or survey devices. And which so, raises raises this whole question of you know how the downhole world is encountering or coping with this wave of digital change that's coming at the industry. Uh, and, it, it, you know, the industry's, you know, we've drilled millions of wells without digital technologies. So, you know, it begs the question, you know, what, what's the, what is the opportunity or the problem that still is out there that, that remains to be solved? And I'm, I'm sure you have a perspective on that. Yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of problems still in the industry that uh, come from the analog world that can be solved through digital technology. Hmm. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, that is going on at a rapid pace right now is just efficiency gains in operations. Mm -hmm. So adding the digital landscape, uh, being able to uh, utilize the big data forefront and, and get all the information that everyone needs off every sensor um, has really driven the efficiency in the industry. Being able to take operators off of well sites, it also increases safety. So I think there's a myriad of different ways that uh, digitizing the industry can uh, improve it. And it feels, feels to be honest, feels like we're just scratching the surface um, of the of, of what's potential out there. But you know, if you if you were to kind of cast your mind back, Chris, to I uh, say five years ago, how is the industry and its adoption of digital? How, how have you seen it improve and change? What what have you what have you picked up? Uh, well, the the main part of the industry that we've been involved in and that I have paid the most attention to is is on the drilling side. Yep. So, um, the drilling forefront, even on land, you see now in North America land, which is usually the last place to adopt any change. <laughs> um, you know, well, that, you that see can't a, be uh, true now, Chris. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well, way know, hard. It starts it, offshore, it's, and it, then it yeah. takes a long time to move on land. So. <laughs> Um, we, we still get a lot of, uh, a lot of the analog world on land, but man, in the last five years, I, uh, it's probably been an exponential culture shift to digital realistically. Uh, everything that you talk about, everything you hear about nowadays is, 
um, talking about digital data, digital information, big data, yeah. analytics. I mean, just that that's everything. It's in, completely inundated the field in the last five years. Yeah, it's been a huge shift. I mean, Cisco wrote a great book called The Digital Vortex, and in it they forecasted that anything that can be digitized will be digitized, which which basically means physical things, people, processes, business models, uh, everything that could you, you could extract some digital value from will, will eventually benefit. And, and the onshore, it, 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 no one's immune to this. So I'm not surprised yeah. to, to hear you share that that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's start, turn to the, uh, to the to this problem of um, tortuosity, which is <laughs> an interesting term. I was, I was thinking about turtles when I first heard about it. I don't know. I don't understand the uh, the the origins of it. And it's a term I'm not familiar with. Maybe you might. Uh, touch on a little bit about what what uh, you know what, what tortuosity actually is. Okay, yeah. So tortuosity is uh, basically a different way of looking at deviation. That's how we utilize it. So mm-hmm. there's a couple different ways, a uh, couple different, I guess, definitions of tortuosity. Historically, tortuosity was looked at in the open hole logging world as a way to describe how fluid would move around different porosity bands in rock Mm. um we use a different a little bit different um definition of it which basically says it's a measurement of any deviation from a straight line so if i think about a well bore generally a vertical um the 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 assumption if you're not in this industry you'd assume if someone's drilling a well steel is steel it doesn't bend theoretically. So therefore, you're, if you're at <laughs> the surface and you're drilling, of course, you're going to drill a straight line. But what you're saying is that's actually not true. You can deviate from the, the straight line that logically would be there. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And not only can you, but I, I uh, would say that you do. Every, <laughs> every well is, is uh, tortuous. Slight, slightly um, off there, center. There's not a yeah. straight well ever drilled, I don't think. Mm. And um, how badly can it go off course before, you know, the, the uh, engineering, analog engineering world can, can detect it? I mean, what's the, what's the history here? Yeah, so, um, again, going back to, you know, the magnetics and how they're used yeah. to drill wells, um, you know, typically you have a, a, a bit and a motor and then a magnetic measurement device uh, in the string, and that's how you guide a well bore while it's being drilled just behind just behind the bit and then you must have some wire line to the ter- surface that provides your uh operator with with guidance data yeah you know? historically it was wire line nowadays they use mud pulse telemetry mm. so they actually pump up the signal uh through the mud and then it's decoded on surface yeah and using vibrations and sound waves through the mud is that the idea yes sir yeah. yes yeah. Okay. So what what they'll do is you'll have your your sensor is is usually anywhere from you know forty to seventy foot behind the bit. Mm-hmm. So basically, you <laughs> guesstimate. <laughs> <laughs> I just see, I can see right Based away the of, issue. It's like it's like driving yeah. your car and you're about seventy feet off every time you turn your wheel. Whoa! <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you're basically taking you know data from the, that you've already drilled, surveys that you've already had, and and you're making a projection to the bit, mm. and that's how wells are drilled. So you can see a lot of things can happen within seventy foot. Oh yeah, uh, in the tortuosity world. Yeah, I've seen some some logs, uh, some that your 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 team have shared with me where the you know the 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 variance it can be shocking uh, as to how far off uh, center the, uh, the 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 bore has gone. But this, of course, you know that that it's like having a kink in a straw. Um, you know, it's it's definitely going to constrict your ability to pull fluid up at some level. But that's not really the problem here, is it? The, is it, it's more the equipment that's down hole or moving stuff up and down the well bore gets jammed in behind these 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 bends off of of off of true. Isn't that absolutely? The, isn't that yeah, the that is yeah. that is the case. Most of the time, they don't have a problem extracting the hydrocarbon due to the tortuosity. Where yeah. the problems come in is, like you said, the production and completions equipment that we put down hole to extract that hydrocarbon. Yeah, right. So your electrical submersible pumps, your basic rod pumps, beam pumps, things like that. All of these things uh, have moving parts in them, mm. and uh, whether it's a, a you know a few thousandths. Uh, of a of a millimeter tolerance or a few foot uh things you know 
that are moving tend to uh, take the path of least resistance. Yeah. So what that means, what we see um, through logging these wells and, and through the, the failures that we've analyzed with this downhole production and completions equipment, what we see is that if you can place these pieces of equipment in the correct areas uh, with the lowest amount of torch velocity, then you definitely have a longer life expectancy for the production equipment. Yeah. Because they're not banging into the well casing or uh, they're, uh, you're not bending them around curves and so on where you're, you're twisting the equipment or damaging in any fashion. Is that, that the way to think about it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of this equipment has been designed over the years um, the, that it can be moved and pushed around curves mm. um, as long as they're gentle or they're a uniform curve. What we see a lot of is as long as they're not, as long as the equipment's not placed in a highly tortuous area, whenever it's actually asked to start up and operate, mm. they can usually get the equipment where they want it without tearing too much stuff up. Now, on ESBs, you do have a, a an MLE, which is the electrical lead that comes up and it runs down the side of it. Mm. That has to be very, you have to be very careful with that running in and out of the hole. So being able to identify these areas of tortuosity uh, throughout the wellboard definitely will let the operator have a better idea of where they need to be careful or how many centralization guides and things like that, that they want to put on these MLEs uh, so they don't tear it up. Um, there was a study that was put out a few years ago by Baker Hughes that 30% of their failures on their ESPs were what they called non-start events. So meaning that the uh, brand new pump went down hole, uh, got to where it was supposed to be, uh, they hooked it up to the electrical source and nothing happened. Ooh. So they have to pull it right back out of the hole. Um, you can imagine uh, <clears throat> the time downtime and the equipment cost that, that comes along with that. But for the most part, what they found on these non-start events is that that electrical lead was actually being damaged going into the hole. And that's why it didn't start. There was nothing wrong with the pump. They just couldn't get power to couldn't it. Couldn't get power to it, yeah. But even so, the cost of doing a round trip like that, pull go back down hole, pull up pull up the equipment, try and figure out what went wrong, re reinstall it, there's thousands, thousands of dollars. Absolutely. Not yeah. to mention loss of production and, and uh, team on the ground and, and um, you know, uh, and, and I presume when the wells get substantial in terms of either production volume or, or just the sheer depth we're working at, the, the costs uh, climb. Absolutely. And if you take loss production into account, then mm -hmm. they just grow exponentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really, really painful. And so the uh, so, so this problem has been in the industry for a long time. And uh, and and, the, you know, if you're in the industry, you know, the, the issues here, you know, that that uh, tortuosity is a fact of life in wells. It's it's virtually impossible to drill true in in ver in all circumstances. Get that. How so? Where's the digital angle here? Like, how does how does how does digital play a role in in helping to solve for this? So the way that digital plays a role for this mm -hmm. is what we've done is we've taken uh, massive amounts of of data. Um, most most of the time, when you do directional surveys, you're taking a survey station every ninety or a hundred foot right, or 30 meters for the international folks. Mm. So that's a very standard um, drilling survey interval. Mm. So what they do is they then take those surveys since they already have them, and they, and they try to use those surveys for every application throughout the, the well, whether it's production equipment, uh, workovers, whatever. Um, what we've done is we've started taking surveys uh, with our tools uh, multiple times per foot. Per and foot. then we'll take all this data – We'll crunch it in and we run it through a, a software package that the guys have put together um, that makes an analysis of the torch velocity of the well bore. And it comes back with, makes a recommendation on the placement for where they want to put the equipment. So, if, so to put it in, back into layman's terms, because some of my some of the audience for this podcast, <clears throat> to be clear, not 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 always oil and gas professionals deep in this area, but uh, so you know, you can imagine a, a well bore where there's multiple bends in in the in the well, and you have to choose your spot where to place the equipment so that it doesn't get damaged going th down the well hole or up again, and has optimal access to produce the hydrocarbons. And, and there's there's some complexity there to figure that problem out. 
And and I think what I hear what I hear you saying is that seventy foot interval measures, <laughs> you're, you're just not the resolution just isn't good enough. Um, Absolutely, and, 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 and even wrong. you know we've looked at ten, fifteen foot intervals, mm -hmm. and the resolution there is not really optimum for this type of application either. So, yeah. what we do is, like you said, we take several different uh, stations throughout the entire well bore. We run what we call continuous logs. Yeah, uh, we take all the data, we crunch it. Uh, put it through the software, and we also take into account what the equipment that they're putting down hole is. So we work with the operator or with the serv the other service company and say, mm -hmm. okay, well, I've got you know you want to put a 200 foot pump in this well bore, and the uh, the OD or the out outer diameter of this pump is four inches. You're going in five and a half casing, so the ID of the casing is 4.92. Yeah. So not a lot of room how, for <laughs> Where where's the best place for this 200 foot device to to fit? Yeah. And get it low enough into the reservoir where we're not going to be starving it of fluid whenever it's actually pumping as well. Yeah, yep, precisely right. And that's the complexity of the problem here. Oh, fascinating. And how does the uh, – so the, the so, so where, where digital is helping out is – sounds like a couple of, a couple of areas. One is it's, you're using and getting measurements much more granular than, than you can with analog. And uh, it, that in turn generates a great deal more data which you can then use in a much more, res, you know, finer resolution, finer fidelity to do much more sh uh, sharper placements of, of the, um, of the downhole equipment. And the, and the upshot of all that is d reduction in failure rates, uh, reduction in, in the need for um, go fishing expeditions to retrieve broken equipment, uh, uh, better, more stable production volumes. Uh, so it sounds like a, like a, a, a terrific use case, really. Um, is that, is that, am I summarizing that correctly? Yeah, no, that's yeah. perfect. That's yeah. perfect. Um, and so, um, in behind all of this is, uh, uh, the new, newer and different sensor technologies. It's, uh, you know, when I was reading the case examples, I, the, the first thought that came to mind mind was, uh, smart pigging in pipelines. Uh, where yes. the yeah pig goes down through the pipe and it's and it's uh, its sensors are picking up uh, micro fractures, um, damage to the pipe. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. It's very very similar concept when you think about it. it. Just happens to be a vertical pipe, not a horizontal. Well, yeah, and we and we do these in in horizontals as well. Oh, of course, um, yeah. So the, the the main difference I think between the two technologies outside of being pipeline versus uh, oil and gas wells mm. is that your your pig is is run through the the pipeline to mm. get the survey or get the log and let you know what anomalies or de deficiencies may be in the pipeline. Whereas this equipment is being put down hole to stay for as long as possible. Mm. So on top of all of the things that you mentioned earlier about getting it down there and getting into the right place, mm. we're also um, adding, you know, months, years, sometimes onto the equipment's productive life before they have to pull it out and have, additional downtime on that well or change it out. Yeah, major, major benefit. Where do you see this technology going? I mean, if you kind of cast your mind out five years, like what, 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 what's, your, what's your view or your perspective around how this uh, d digital will, will impact? Um, and, uh, you know, tortuosity uh, is one thing, but uh, more broadly, the whole uh, downhole world. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> how will digital impact the downhole world? <laughs> well, I, I mean, there, there, my sense is that we barely, personally, we, I think we barely scratched the surface of what digital can do in the downhole. I agree, hundred percent. I think uh, you'll see digital technology take over uh, every aspect of our life at some point. Yeah, like you said earlier. Mm. So, I think specifically to torch velocity or to the micro guide log that we're talking about. You know, we've been focused mainly on. We've been focused mainly on the production and completions equipment of of the side of the business. I think in the future, what you'll see is is utilizing this type of technology, this big data, this torch velocity logging technology to do a better job in drilling the wells. So not only will we be able to drill wells faster like we do today, we see all the efficiency gains that we get from from digital technology in the oil field today, being able to drill wells faster. But I think utilizing towards Wasi logging in the future, if we can drill a better well and not decrease the efficiency that we're drilling the wells fast, now you get the benefit on both sides. Yeah. So you get to be able to drill more wells, which costs the operator less to drill, but you also get a very good quality well bore out of it. So 
uh, if you can drill them better in the beginning, then you don't have to run into these issues uh, later on and, and have to replace the equipment and, and have non-start events or wear holes in your tubing and casing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I've seen this over and over again, which is uh, the, the uh, in, in oil and gas, the analysis that gets carried out after the fact uh, is slowly becoming analysis that gets carried out in the moment. And the result of that is a f- superior outcome in the end because there's fewer built-in anomalies or built-in errors and issues that you know remain to be detected in the case of an analog uh, well uh, drilled with with its uh, hidden tortu- tortuosity problems <laughs> in the seventy-four yeah. intervals. Yeah. We're actually working on uh, we're currently working on a, a product or a solution uh, where we could do that real time through our guide center. We have a, yeah. uh, a full-time operations center here that. Uh, where we have engineers staff 24 hours a day, and we're looking at ways that we can take the the real time drilling data that we get off of some of these sensors. There's actually a a, a technology in in Alberta uh, that um, I've come across, which is a, a company called um, Enersight. And uh, what Enersight uh, does is uh, interpret the drilling cuttings as they come up the uh, bore, and uh, using high definition photography, build a and artificial intelligence build a uh, grain of sand view uh, of what is downhole, and, and uh, they're doing that in real time as the drilling is being carried out. You can imagine you, you know, start to kind of piece together the, the you know creating a uh, effectively a fully digital version of what's actually going on downhole in the reservoir, combining reservoir understanding plus uh, a, a drilling understanding and and creating a much sharper understanding of the of the of the well. Uh, will save enormous amounts of energy <clears throat> after the fact in maintenance and operations, well servicing and the like. So big, big potential coming. Yeah, very interesting. I, I've read another article uh, recently about a company that's looking to utilize the same type of technology, mud logging um, type technology to actually look at the lithology of the wells, not only the lithology, but the actual production zones and uh, almost get an open hole style log while they're drilling the well just by using the cuttings and the mud logging systems. Yeah. Very interesting technology that's coming on the forefront now. Yeah, yeah it's all fascinating. How's the, how's the industry reacted to, uh, uh, to, to your, you know, your innovations? I mean, I can, I can imagine stepping into someone who's been drilling wells for, for 30 years and you're telling them, hey, you're doing this all wrong. I've got a better idea. Uh, what, what's, 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 what's the reaction? Well, it's it's interesting. We've had uh, obviously a lot of different reactions. The productions and completions guys seem to love us because we're helping them uh, maximize the efficiency of their equipment, not only where they're placing it, but how it operates. Um, and then they go over to the drilling side and say, hey, you know, you guys are drilling these wells crooked. And the drilling guys say, no, nah, that's not what we're doing. So we, we get a little bit of resistance from one side and we get, a, you know, arms wide open from the other side. So uh, it, it's been an interesting dynamic that we've had to kind of work through over the last few years uh, going through all of this with the operators. But um yeah. Overall, I think the industry has has accepted tortuosity. Um, you know, we had a battle on our hands at the beginning with that, just being able to move from a conventional kind of survey technology or language about survey technology into the tortuosity realm. And I think that that's uh, the industry has accepted that now. So uh, good first step. And if if they can accept tortuosity and understand what it is, then being able to alleviate that tortuosity is the next step. So. Um, hopefully we can get uh, a little bit better uh, help on that side. And, and what, uh, I mean, going through the experience of uh, as a, you know, developing this innovation, taking it into an industry that is, you know, as, as, as tough it is uh, to, to do work in oil and gas, what, what, what advice would you have for others who, who might be contemplating, um, you know, trying to engineer digitally driven change in the industry? What, I mean, what, 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 would you, what would you advise them to do or not do? Uh, interesting question. I think the the number one thing that that you have to take into account whenever you're introducing any type of change is to have good, strong data to back up your hypothesis, right? Yeah, so do a lot of testing, so. um, get good data, get a lot of good case studies. Uh, and then one thing that we've done that's really helped us out a lot is we've gotten very involved. We've always been very involved with a lot of the steering committees for wellbore placement and things like that over the years with SPE and, and things like that, but actually writing 
uh, peer reviewed papers and putting the data out there for everyone to look at and uh, getting their buy in through these um, through these different organizations has really helped us a lot with this as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Repetition is important in oil and gas. The industry uh, values um, hearing and seeing the data. Uh, it's not just a tell me, it's a show me world. And that's an important uh, important uh, piece of insight is to you know, get involved with the ecosystem of uh, that surrounds the industry. SP is one piece of it. Um, but there's many, many associations and, and supporting, Absolutely. supporting the industry. We've been really okay. blessed to have some really great clients over the years uh, that have let us come out and, and test a lot of this stuff in their well bores. And, and uh, so that really helped us a lot. And they, and they help us write the papers as well, as long as it, uh, as long as it helps them out and, and they see value in it, then they love to help uh, write that kind of stuff as well. Mm. Hey, uh, Chris, this has been a, a terrific um, uh, a time together. I appreciate hearing how and learning more about uh, this this uh, specific area of, of uh, the industry and, and, the sp- and the challenge that it faces. Uh, if someone wanted to learn more about this, how do they? Uh, what, what, what advice would you give them? How do they? How do they find you? What do you have a website or a, uh, how, do, how do they? How do they track yeah, you? Yeah, we do. Yeah, they can. We're we're on all different social media. So it's gyrodata.com is the website. www.gyrodata.com. Uh, and then they can also follow us on LinkedIn. We have a Facebook page. Uh, so we do uh, post all kinds of things on those. Uh, platforms as well well you got to get an instagram account that's that's next i'm sure we do <laughs> get some pictures tiktok that's your next move yeah there you go i don't know if they would like us uh dancing around the office on the tiktok Pro- probably not. not probably not it's not suitable for work <laughs> well chris this has been this has been uh, terrific thanks very much well great thank you very much for having us on and and we appreciate your time as well uh, so that wraps up this uh, episode of Digital Oil and Gas, and uh, much thanks to my guests, uh, Chris Earle and uh, Jaro Data for uh, their support with um, coming on the show. Uh, look for another podcast, same time next week. Bye for now. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil & Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.